merci. Uh, je regrette, mais il me faut parler anglais. As we say in English, c'est la vie. Um, so uh, I will try and keep my bad jokes to a minimum. Uh, I was going to just begin with a, a very brief background on the, the Merley's review itself, and then uh, just to emphasize that what I'm talking about uh, today is an important but, but fairly small part of, of what you can find uh, in the, the complete Merley's review. Um, so the uh, process which led to the Merley's review was very much inspired a few years ago by thinking that uh, we were approaching the 30th uh, anniversary of the Mead report, which was published by the Institute for Fiscal Studies and came out in 1978. And our objective was to, uh, to publish something 30 years later, and we're, we're three years late with, uh, with that objective. But uh, nevertheless, later this year, the actual uh, second and final volume of the Merley's Review will, uh, will appear in print. Um, everything uh, is basically available for free on the, on the IFS website, and, and the link is there, and uh, uh, I'm happy to leave these slides if, uh, if that's useful. I should say that uh, this project was generously funded by the Economic and Social uh, Research Council, which is the government uh, research council that funds research in economics uh, in the UK, and, uh, and partly funded by, by the Nuffield Foundation. So the objectives that we, uh, we set ourselves were to try and think about uh, the characteristics of a good tax system for an open, modern, developed uh, economy round about now in, in the uh, early part of the 21st uh, century, and uh, very much looking at the system as, as a whole, not, not focusing too much on individual taxes in, in isolation, but thinking about how they fit together and form the overall uh, system which, which raises something like 40 to 50 percent of, uh, of national income uh, in, in uh, many uh, modern uh, developed countries. And then to think about how, uh, how different this was from the tax system that we have, particularly in the UK uh, at present, and to think about how we might uh, propose some reforms for specifically for reforming the UK tax system towards something closer to to what we at least think uh, economics suggests uh, uh, a more efficient uh, tax system would look like. We proceeded uh, in two stages. We commissioned uh, experts on various uh, components of, of, uh, of taxation, of various components of tax systems, to write uh, uh, papers for us, and the 13 of these, together with uh, expert commentaries, were, are already published in uh, volume one of the Merley's Review called Dimensions of Tax Design, which was published by Oxford University Press in April last year. And uh, there's an enormous book which is useful for uh, putting on coffee tables, but everything is available free of charge uh, online from, from the website, particularly uh, useful for students who might be interested. I should say that... Uh, both Pierre Pestier and Thomas Piketty uh, contributed expert commentaries to volume one of, uh, of the Merley's review. Volume two of, uh, of the review, which I, I confess has taken us rather longer than we anticipated, uh, is entitled Tax by Design. And the idea is that a smaller group of, of people uh, would get together and uh, try and uh, take stock of the evidence presented in the first volume and to think about how, in their view, this, this would lead to reforms of the, the tax system as a whole. So we formally launched this at the end of last year and preprints, uh, kind of almost final versions of everything is, is available uh, on the IFS website. The actual book will hopefully uh, be published uh, by the end of this year. So this was done by a, a smaller group of people headed by Professor Sir James Merleys and including uh, the people you can, uh, you can see uh, listed on the slide. Um, just to say something about the scope of the review of, as a whole before I start to focus on, on capital income taxation, the kind of fundamental um, feature of this, and, and in contrast to at least the way much tax policy making is done within government in, in the UK, 
uh, is that we're very much thinking about the system uh, uh, as a whole. So it's very common in thinking about tax reform in the UK to take one particular piece of the tax system, maybe the corporate income tax, and to say there are features of this we, we don't like, we'd like to change them, but it has to be done in a revenue neutral way, uh, raising as much money from the corporate income tax in the future as we expected to get in the past, and we think that's uh, very restrictive and not necessarily the best way of thinking about getting serious reform of the uh, tax system as a whole. So within the, the sphere of, uh, of capital income taxation, as I, I hope you will see, even if you don't like our proposals, I hope you will at least recognize that the proposals we have on uh, the personal taxation of income from, from savings are closely related and fit together with the proposals that we have on the corporate income side on the taxation of profits. And where I think you can see this most clearly is where the personal and corporate tax systems meet in, in relation to how this works in relation to taxing uh, various uh, forms of small businesses, be they uh, self-employed people or uh, people running small companies. Okay, so uh, we hope that the overall package of reforms uh, across the system as a whole is, is, is roughly revenue neutral, but as you will see, uh, not everything that I'm going to talk about today uh, individually is going to meet that test. We also took a number of constraints. We, we needed to make some decisions at the outset to uh, keep this task somewhat manageable. So some of the things that we just took as given and, and outside of the scope of the review to, to disagree with were the overall size of government in terms of, uh, of government spending or in the long run av average uh, tax receipts as a share of GDP. Uh, we, we just take the, the UK uh, current position as given and uh, don't comment any further on that. We're aiming to, to keep the overall uh, degree of progressivity or, or redistribution in the tax system roughly in line with, uh, with what it is in the UK at present. And if, if I understood uh, one of the presentations this morning correctly, uh, that's a surprisingly high degree of redistribution by, uh, by international standards. Um, we also focus very much on uh, tax design, thinking about formulating tax policy uh, in an open economy environment and often in a, in a small open economy environment. Uh, most of us think of the UK as a small open economy, uh, certainly in relation to, to world capital markets. So we're not uh, proposing anything that would require massive expansion of the degree of international coordination or cooperation on taxation. We're taking as given the UK's treaty obligations, both in relation to European Union treaties and, and the network of bilateral uh, treaty obligations. You may think this is all too modest, but those were some of the uh, things that we decided to, to work with uh, at the beginning. Okay, so the scope of what I want to, to say for the rest of this talk is to focus on uh, taxing returns on uh, various forms of saving and various forms of capital investment, starting with the personal taxation of uh, income and capital gains on, on household savings, and then looking at the taxation of uh, corporate profits, and uh, say a few words at, at the end on, on how these fit together in the uh, area of small business taxation. So, I mean, the basic guiding principles from an economic perspective are not, uh, not terribly radical, I think. We, uh, where we see distortions that we can't think of good reasons, uh, correcting um, externalities or market failures that, uh, that these distortions are, uh, are addressing, our basic instinct is to try and minimize them. And uh, in the context of, of household savings, therefore, we're thinking about minimizing uh, distortions to intertemporal allocation of consumption or decisions about when uh, income is consumed over the life cycle. We also give probably more attention than most uh, academic treatments uh, of this topic to uh, neutrality across different ways in which uh, individuals or households can, can hold their savings and neutrality across different ways in which uh, those savings can be used by, by the business sector to, uh, to generate higher returns in the future. And uh, we give quite a lot of emphasis to uh, avoiding uh, any sensitivity to uh, the rate of price inflation. So those are the 
kind of basic principles that lead us to, uh, to our proposals. Um, to start then with, with uh, the, treat, the personal taxation of uh, income uh, on household uh, savings, uh, our basic perspective here is a, a fairly standard uh, economic uh, life cycle perspective. We think uh, most saving uh, can best be thought of as, uh, as deferring consumption from this period to some period in the future. So we rehearse some of the uh, efficiency arguments for uh, not wanting to uh, distort intertemporal consumption choices. We think these are somewhat important, but actually uh, we don't think these, these issues are decisive in thinking about, uh, about uh, real-world capital tax uh, policy. So we start with the kind of Atkinson Stiglitz uh, view of the world, which says it's not obvious that taxing people who choose to consume at a later stage in their life more than people who uh, choose to consume at an earlier stage uh, in their life allows uh, the desired degree of redistribution to be achieved at a lower efficiency cost. We, we add that uh, nor can we think of any, any terribly strong equity grounds for uh, taxing people with different preferences uh, in radically different ways. But we certainly recognize that there are opposing uh, arguments uh, the difficulty seems to be that there are opposing arguments both ways. So uh, we review the evidence on the retirement, uh, retirement uh, puzzle that um, uh, household consumption tends to fall when, uh, when, when people retire, rather more than can be uh, accounted for by uh, issues like uh, they no longer have to uh, buy expensive lunches uh, in work canteens and uh, they no longer have to buy clothing and other items for uh, related to, uh, to working. Um, so there seems to be this retirement savings puzzle, and one leading explanation for that is that people are myopic. They don't uh, look uh, far enough into the future and, and plan their future consumption optimally, and at face value, that would lead to an argument for subsidizing saving, or at least subsidizing retirement saving. Uh, on the other hand, there are some, some very uh, coherent arguments, and I expect Pierre Pestier will be uh, reviewing them in more detail in his talk, uh, for wanting to tax capital income. So uh, a leading one would be that actually there may be a correlation between people's unobserved productivity or unobserved ability that we would like to tax and how patient they are, what their, what their discount rate is. There's, there's, uh, clear evidence that more able people on average tend, tend to be more patient, and that suggests we might, use, uh, we might use how much saving they do, which depends on how patient they are, as a tag for their uh, unobserved uh, ability, and that would lead to a very coherent argument for wanting to tax capital income. What I don't think uh, we took the view is that where the balance between these conflicting arguments lies uh, is not obvious, and uh, we don't think that the empirical literature has yet caught up with the theoretical literature in a way which gives us a, a clear view as to whether we want positive, uh, negative, or zero taxation on capital income. So we kind of uh, left this uh, somewhat undecided. And uh, rather than, uh, than me say that, I, I'd like to quote a leading authority uh, on this subject who's written recently the following, uh, following words. It is fair to say that existing models so far do not provide plausible conclusions about optimal capital tax rates. And I defer to Thomas Piketty as the author of this uh, distinguished sentence in his commentary on, uh, uh, in the Murley's Review, Volume 1. So I'm not going to uh, discuss that uh, in much more detail. I'm sure we'll be returning to that later in this session. Okay. Pierre, Pierre is already arguing with that, so... Uh, Okay, what we emphasize rather more is uh, if you want to tax capital income, and I'm, I'm not going to advocate that we don't tax capital income at all, in case, in case anybody gets that impression. We're going to distinguish between what we refer to as the normal return or the required rate of return, approximately the risk-free interest rate that you could earn by putting your savings into a very safe bank account, if, if in the modern world you can find a very safe bank account, um, we're going to distinguish that component of the, of the return on savings and, and essentially argue that that shouldn't be taxed. 
from any surplus supernormal rent component of uh, returns, which we're, we're definitely going to argue uh, should be taxed and should be taxed in full at uh, the individual's marginal personal tax rate. But the normal component of, of uh, income from capital, in our view, simply cannot be taxed uh, in a coherent way uh, under a standard income tax approach. And two particular illustrations of that that I'll talk about a little bit more are the way in which standard income taxes uh, deal with uh, the distinction between uh, income in the form of cash, things like interest receipts and dividend receipts, versus capital income in the form of uh, accruing uh, wealth or, or capital gains. Um, secondly, we, we observe in practice that uh, almost every uh, income tax system in, in the OECD, I think Israel might be one exception, uh, is ju are just hopeless in dealing with inflation. So if inflation is going up and down, effective tax rates on income from capital are going up and down in a way which I challenge any uh, optimal tax model to, to rationalise. Uh, in contrast, we, we notice uh, very much in line with uh, predecessors uh, in, in the Mead Review that uh, a uniform treatment of uh, all different forms of saving in principle uh, can be achieved if we follow a different strategy. Uh, and we kind of characterize this as uh, exempting from taxation this normal or required or risk-free rate of return component uh, of, uh, of capital income which, as I said, would, would essentially correspond to applying the risk-free uh, interest rate on uh, a measure of, uh, of your stock of, uh, of savings. Okay. So with many, many assets out there in the world providing different mixes of returns in the form of cash income, interest or dividends, uh, and capital gains, uh, it's very challenging to, uh, to tax the normal return component of, of capital income in a uniform way. Well, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. The kind of easier one to, 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 to discuss first is the effect of inflation. Uh, almost all income taxes uh, have little or no indexation uh, for inflation. So rather than taxing the real return, uh, real, uh, corresponding to a real interest rate that people are earning on savings, they typically tax nominal interest receipts in full. Uh, they typically, not, not quite so universally, tax nominal capital gains uh, in full. Uh, of course, full indexation is perfectly possible uh, in theory, and uh, I've been told recently that there's a pretty good approximation to this in Israel, there was certainly a period, I, I think in the 1970s, when there was a pretty good approximation to full indexation uh, in Denmark. And until quite recently, we had elements, but, but never complete indexation of, of various capital income tax bases uh, in the UK. Um, but these are rare. And even when countries have introduced them, once inflation falls back down to, to more tolerable levels, uh, these, these indexation provisions are typically repealed. And one argument is that they introduce a lot of complexity into, uh, into tax systems and, uh, and complexity, although tax systems are, of course, extremely complicated. Uh, reducing complexity is often put forward as a reason for not wanting to have uh, proper indexation. Taxing capital gains on uh, realisation only uh, favours assets which generate returns in the form of capital gains over assets which, which generate returns in the form of, of cash income, even if uh, on realisation when assets are sold, the uh, capital gains are then taxed uh, at full marginal rates. And the reason is that uh, if, you, uh, if you enjoy an increase in the value of an asset and then you wait 10 years until you sell the asset and pay the tax, that's equivalent to an interest-free loan from the government or the tax authority to you, and uh, interest-free loans, as we know, are, are valuable. Uh, if, you've made, uh, if you've made a gain on an asset and you have the option of keeping it uh, rather than selling it, you obviously have an incentive to keep it for longer than you would otherwise choose to do, and that's the so-called uh, lock-in effect. And uh, as a result of this, there are, there are big incentives out there to convert uh, income uh, into the form of, of capital gains wherever that's possible. And the one area where it's particularly straightforward is in the context of small businesses. So rather than 
take a salary out of uh, my business today, I can uh, take a lower salary, uh, leave the cash in uh, the business's uh, bank account and watch the, va the value of the business go up, and maybe at some point in the future when I choose to retire, I'll, uh, I'll take that as a capital gain. So we think that's certainly inequitable because some people have the opportunity to do that much more easily and to a much greater extent than others. And uh, since governments uh, don't like this kind of uh, tax avoidance, this certainly in the UK has led to the introduction of extraordinarily complex uh, anti-avoidance legislation trying to minimise uh, the circumstances in which, uh, in which uh, people in general and small business proprietors in particular can take advantage of these, uh, of these tax, tax incentives to... Uh, to take more of their income in the form of capital gains. Now, again, we know in theory from the work of, uh, of Alan Albach and David Bradford and others that it's perfectly possible to tax capital gains uh, on realisation, but in a, in a way which is completely equivalent to taxing capital gains uh, on accrual. Uh, but now I'm very confident this has never been implemented in, in, in practice, and I would uh, be willing to wager quite a lot that... that uh, those elegant uh, but somewhat complex uh, procedures that would be needed uh, are just not the kind of thing that's really going to be implemented in, in practice in, uh, in real countries. Okay, so that's kind of focusing on, on the inflation and capital gain side. Now returning to more, more standard territory, the, the other issue with the standard income tax treatment of, of capital income uh, is the intertemporal distortion. So a standard income tax reduces the rate of return uh, which uh, individuals or households are earning on their savings and in a way which is likely to discourage saving and to encourage uh, immediate uh, consumption. So in the report we discuss two uh, alternative approaches to, uh, to capital taxation in general which uh, have the, the feature of avoiding this intertemporal distortion and uh, arguably, uh, at least as important, arguably more importantly, also have the advantage that they avoid sensitivity to inflation and they have the property of treating uh, cash income and capital gains in a uniform way. So one approach is the expenditure tax approach, which was very prominent in, uh, in the Mead report, uh, goes back at least as far as, as work by, uh, by Caldor on this in the 1950s, and I, I dare say uh, earlier, earlier than that. And uh, the alternative approach, which has been developed more recently, particularly in work by uh, Peter Birch Sorensen, uh, we dub the rate of return allowance approach, or perhaps more accurately, the normal rate of return uh, allowance approach. And one thing that we emphasize is that, in a, in a fundamental sense, there's, there's a broad equivalence between these two administratively and operationally very different approaches. They're, they're both alternative ways of shifting the direct tax base from income to consumption. Uh, but the timing of tax payments and, and, and some of the operational features of the way they do it is, is radically different. So the expenditure tax approach basically extends to all forms of saving the uh, treatment of contributions to private pension uh, plans in the US, the UK, and, and many other countries. That is, you can save out of uh, untaxed income or you get tax relief on your contributions to pension plans or more generally the expenditure tax approach would allow you tax relief on any uh, inflow into a savings account, any purchase uh, of an asset. There would be no taxation on, on the returns earned as long as you keep your money in the account or as long as you hold the asset, but in contrast to a, an income tax approach, when you withdraw money from the account or when you sell the asset, the complete outflow would be taxed at that point. Just as when, when you receive uh, pensions paid out of a private pension plan, the whole pension uh, income is taxable at that point. Okay, so that's basically ex extending to all forms of saving uh, an approach which we're, we're familiar with in the context of private pension plans. The rate of return allowance looks radically different from that. There would be no tax relief for inflows. You would save out of taxed income, not out of untaxed income. Uh, you would then get tax relief on a year-by-year -year basis for what we, we deem the normal component 
uh, of, of returns on those savings. And if you're familiar with something called the ACE or Allowance for Corporation, uh, Allowance for Corporate Equity form of, of, of corporate tax, this is basically uh, applying to personal uh, income taxation, that approach which uh, has been developed uh, early, at an earlier stage in the context of business taxation. So there are features in common of the expenditure tax and the, and the rate of return allowance approach. One common feature is that they, they don't tax the normal return, but they do tax any supernormal or excess uh, uh, component of, of returns on capital, uh, which uh, sometimes referred to as economic rents. And thinking about the equivalence comes from thinking about the rate of return allowance as an expenditure tax with deferred tax relief for saving rather than immediate upfront tax relief for saving. There's a third approach which uh, for some assets we also think would be, would be appropriate essentially because it's much simpler and that's not to tax the, uh, the capital income at all and assets where, where excess returns are likely to be, to be zero, uh, things like uh, standard uh, interest bearing accounts with, with banks and other regulated financial institutions where, where there's essentially going to be no rents at stake, uh, a simpler approach is just to exempt uh, interest income on those kinds of assets from uh, income taxation completely. So let me just try and illustrate with a very simple example this equivalence point and, and highlight the, the key assumption uh, un, under which you, you get this equivalence result, which is uh, an, essentially a perfect capital markets kind of assumption. So the example is to think about an individual who's saving uh, £100, I apologise for my uh, currency here, or €100 Euros if you prefer, uh, in an account which just pays a, a safe uh, interest rate. Now, in my, my example, to keep the numbers very simple, I'm, I'm taking this to be 10%. Obviously, that's uh, rather higher than, than we could uh, get in the current environment on a safe account, but it has the advantage of keeping the numbers uh, more manageable. Okay, so in, in such a, a framework, the, the individual next year would have uh, interest income, 10% of 100, giving him interest income of £10. We have a standard income tax treatment of that interest income, uh, again, to make the, the numbers uh, straightforward, let's, let's assume a, a simple tax rate of 20%. Uh, the tax paid on the interest income of £10 would be £2, and our individual would have post-tax interest income of eight pounds. So the rate of return on our, our saving of 100 is reduced from the pre-tax rate of return of 10% to the post-tax uh, rate of return uh, of 8% by, by the standard income tax treatment. Notice in passing, the higher is inflation, the higher are nominal interest rates, uh, the bigger this distortion is going to be. Uh, so this uh, provides a disincentive to save or, or, an, or an incentive to consume immediately, and it will be particularly important for the kinds of households who, who save in forms that, uh, that we commonly tax. And uh, the kinds of households who save disproportionate amounts of their, their wealth in uh, interest-bearing accounts of this form, which governments find it straightforward to tax, are overwhelmingly uh, poorer households. We just note that uh, as a particular problem with the way that we do things in the UK, at least. Uh, arguably, this is, this is regressive. Okay, we could obviously avoid this by uh, exempting all interest income from taxation, but we can also avoid this by either the expenditure tax approach or by introducing this rate of return allowance within our existing income tax system. So the expenditure tax approach would give the saver tax relief when he does the savings. So if the tax rate is, is 20% on savings of £100, our saver would get tax relief of, of £20. So net of this tax relief, the, the saver is only having to, to sacrifice £80 of current consumption in order to, uh, to get an account which says he's got £100 uh, saved in his, his account. One year later, the withdrawal of £110 would be taxed in full. So again, at a tax rate of 20%, that would generate a tax payment in, in the second year of £22. So after tax, our saver is giving up uh, 80, and what he's getting in return is 88, that is 110, minus the tax payment of 22. And lo and behold, that's a post-tax rate of return of 10%. 
Okay, so the expenditure tax has the property that it doesn't uh, reduce or distort the uh, intertemporal price of consumption or the rate of return which, uh, which the household can earn on their savings. Okay, we can achieve that in other ways, and, uh, and what we call, uh, or what I call on this slide, a generalised cash flow approach would, would proceed as follows. Let's not give tax relief of £20 in the year that our individual makes the savings. Let's allow him to carry this forward to next year. And when he carries it forward to next year, let's mark that up using the risk-free rate of interest rate, which in this example is assumed to be 10%. So next year, our individual has uh, a tax allowance, uh, which he can use against his expenditure tax liability next year, and the tax allowance will be 22. But 22 was the, uh, the uh, expenditure tax liability uh, at a tax rate of 20% uh, of 20 on a withdrawal of 110. So this is just equivalent to the no-tax case in this example, where the saver is just earning the normal rate of return. Our saver here is giving up £100 this year, but getting a, the full £110 next year. And again, his post-tax rate of return is equal to 10%, just as it was in the absence of taxation. Okay. So these two approaches will be equivalent or not, depending on whether the saver is indifferent between getting tax relief of £20 this year, which is the way this works under the Mead-style expenditure tax approach, or getting tax relief of £22 one year, one year later. Now, in a world with perfect capital markets, where everybody can, can lend or borrow at our risk-free interest rate of 10%, uh, that, that equivalent se seems rather reasonable. And uh, depending on your view of the degree of perfection of capital markets, uh, the differences may, may be more important uh, in practice than this suggested. But that's the broad nature of the equivalence between these two approaches. Okay, so that can be implemented in, in various ways. It could be implemented exactly as I've described it, uh, or it could be implemented in a way which just involves introducing uh, an allowance against the current income tax uh, base. And that's, that's what Peter Sorensen and others have termed the rate of return allowance. So the rate of return allowance is calculated uh, as some uh, risk-free interest rate multiplied by the stock of savings that our individual or household holds at the end of the previous year. So in our example, that's 10% of the savings of 100, giving a rate of return allowance, or more accurately, a normal rate of return allowance of £10 available to the saver in the second year. And then we tax all income from savings plus any realised capital gains net of this rate of return allowance. So in our example, we had interest income of £10. Net of the rate of return allowance gives, uh, gives no tax liability to this saver who's just earning a normal rate of return. One very important feature of this is that the treatment of, of uh, what I've termed in inverted commas losses, that is uh, returns or measured returns below the rate of return allowance, uh, must be symmetric with the treatment of profits or returns above the rate of return allowance for these neutrality properties to hold. So there are various ways in which you can achieve a symmetric treatment of, of tax losses. One would be to allow them to be relieved immediately against any other taxes that our individual is paying on other sources of income. Uh, an alternative would be to allow losses to be carried forward, and when they're carried forward, they should be marked up from this year to next year uh, at the, uh, the risk-free interest rate that's prevailing. OK, so just very briefly on inflation, uh, because this is pretty straightforward, the expenditure tax approach and the rate of return allowance approach require no explicit indexation for inflation because everything is done on the basis of nominal uh, cash flows. So um, it makes no difference in the example we've just looked at whether the, the risk-free uh, interest rate corresponds to a real interest rate of 10% and uh, inflation of zero, or whether the, the, the risk-free real interest rate is a more reasonable number like 2% and price inflation is running at uh, approximately 8%. Everything that we looked at in the example goes through in just the same way. So we don't require any explicit uh, indexation. 
and effective tax rates on uh, capital income uh, on the normal return component of capital income remain zero, regardless of whether inflation is zero or uh, 8% or any other number. Okay, so they, they deal very straightforwardly with inflation. Okay. Uh, both the expenditure tax and the rate of return allowance approaches also uh, achieve a uniform treatment of uh, cash income and capital gains and hence avoid any distortion to the composition of portfolios between assets which generate uh, income or assets which generate capital gains. Now, to illustrate this, we need to make the example uh, slightly more uh, complicated. Uh, we need to have our individual saving for at least two years. Okay, so I now want to, want to run through what happens if our individual is saving £100 for two years. We'll again assume that the risk-free interest rate is, is 10% and constant across both of these years. We're now going to give the individual a choice uh, between two assets, an income-generating asset, asset I, and uh, a capital gain-generating asset, which we'll call asset G on the next slide. Okay, so asset I is going to pay interest, just like the, uh, the interest-bearing uh, asset we've just looked at. Uh, interest will be £10 in the first year. We assume that that uh, interest income of £10 in the first year is reinvested. The end of the first year, we've got a stock of 110 and then we get 10% of that again in the second year, giving an interest income of £11 in the second year. Adding that to the principal that we've got at the end of the first year of 110 gives our individual £121 after two years, okay, in the absence of any tax. Uh, asset G simply appreciates in value, so its value goes up by 10% in the first year. Uh, on a mark-to-market -market basis, the value would then be 110 at the end of, of year one, and it goes up by 10% again, uh, so that its value at the end of, of the second year is, is also £121. So in the absence of tax, these are just two different ways in which our individual can convert £100 now into £121 in two years' time. Okay, if there's no uncertainty about that return and there are no transaction costs involved uh, in buying or selling these assets or dealing with your financial intermediaries, we would expect uh, individuals to be indifferent between which of those two assets they choose to hold. And ideally, we'd like them to remain indifferent uh, when we start taxing these assets. That is not achieved by a standard income tax approach. So for asset I, which generates uh, easy-to-tax uh, interest income, there'd be a tax on the interest income uh, in the first year, and there'd be a tax on the interest income in the second year. Okay. Asset G, which, which generates capital gains, uh, almost invariably are only taxed when individuals choose to sell those assets, partly because it's administratively infeasible to think about marking to market every single asset that every single taxpayer holds, and partly because individuals may not have any resources uh, to pay the tax prior to, to actually selling these assets. So a tax on the realised gain of £21 in the second year is a better deal for the taxpayer than paying tax of £10 in the first year and £11 in the second year. The tax on the accrued gain of £10 after the first year is deferred for a year until the asset is sold, and this is completely equivalent to uh, offering this taxpayer an interest-free loan over that period. Okay, so capital gains are favoured over cash income in a standard income tax which taxes capital gains on realisation, and we get the lock-in effect and, and various other distortions and uh, complexities. How does the, the rate of return allowance deal with this? Well, let's just, just go through it uh, for a moment. Uh, asset I, uh, no tax is going to be paid in either year if we assume that this 10% in the example is just the, the risk-free rate of return. So our individual gets uh, a rate of return allowance, 10% uh, of, of his savings of 100 uh, in the first year, which just wipes out his, his tax liability. Remember that 10, 10 pounds of income is reinvested, so at the end of the first year, his stock of savings is 110, and uh, the rate of return allowance in the second year is therefore 10% of that, giving a rate of return allowance of 11 pounds in the second year, and no tax paid on the normal return uh, that this individual is earning on his savings. What about the asset which generates 
its uh, capital gains. Well, it's a little more complicated, but not much. Uh, the, set, the rate of return allowance in the first year is exactly the same. Uh, the individual has saved 100. We give him a rate of return allowance of £10 uh, in the first year. Now, he's no taxable income in the first year because all he's done is hold on to this asset, which has gone up in value. He hasn't sold it, so there's no realised capital gain that we step in and tax. So, so he's generating what we refer to as a tax loss in the first year here. He's got a tax loss of £10. Uh, and the simplest way of dealing with this and seeing the equivalence is to allow him to carry that tax loss forward, marked up at the risk-free interest rate, giving him an allowance of £11 in the second year, Okay, which is repeated in the first half of, of this slide. In the second year, he's also got his rate of return allowance for the second year, which is going to be calculated as 10% times what the tax authority thinks is his stock of savings. Well, all the tax authority has seen is the £100 that he used to purchase this asset in the first place. So in the second year, his rate of return allowance for year two will just be 10% of the historic cost uh, value of those savings, giving him an allowance of 10 Add that to the uh, 11, which he's carrying forward from the first year, and uh, he's got a total uh, tax allowance of 21 in the second year, which exactly offsets the tax liability on his realised capital gain when he sells the asset for 121 in year two. Okay, so as with, uh, with asset I, no tax would be paid uh, on, a, on a growth asset, which is just earning the normal rate of return. Okay, it, it can easily be checked, and I've, I've got this on the slides, I, I think in the interest of uh, time I'll probably skip the detail, it can be easily checked that this uniform treatment of assets which generate cash income and assets which generate uh, capital gains extends to assets which earn, earn supernormal uh, returns or economic uh, rents. So on the slides, we've got a little example where we suppose that the risk-free interest rate is 5%, but assets I and asset G uh, continue to, to earn 10%. Just go through a little argument showing that the present value of the tax paid uh, is going to be the same in both cases, regardless of whether that, uh, that uh, economic rent comes in the form of, of cash income or, uh, or uh, capital gain. Okay, the, the rate of return allowance we think has some advantages over the Mead style uh, expenditure tax approach. Uh, one, just in terms of implementation and administration. So, this simply requires information on uh, cash income in the form of interest or dividends and information on realized capital gains, which we would anyway need to have information on if we were thinking about implementing a standard uh, income tax. Uh, measuring the stock of savings which is used to, uh, to determine the rate of return allowance just requires us to keep track of uh, what individuals uh, put in to, uh, to savings accounts or use to purchase assets. There are no complicated indexation or mark-to-market uh, rules required, and that simply needs to be multiplied by a risk-free uh, interest rate in order to calculate the rate of return allowance. Uh, in principle, this would correspond uh, in normal times to something like a nominal interest rate earned on, on secure assets. And uh, in normal times, uh, we, think, we think of government securities uh, as providing us with uh, a good approximation to, uh, to a risk-free interest rate. I wouldn't be proposing that as the particular rate of return to be using in Greece at the moment. Um, but uh, in France and, and the UK, I think it would still give us a pretty decent approximation. So other than that, the administration of this just works like a standard income tax, which we think is a little simpler than the, the administration of, uh, of a Mead-style expenditure tax. Another advantage which, uh, which certainly the UK tax authorities uh, perceive as being important uh, is that uh, the government isn't required under this rate of return allowance approach to provide taxpayers with upfront tax relief in return for the promise of future tax payments. So in a, in a, in a cold and miserable country like Britain, where people, people tend to work and then retire to, to warmer and more pleasant places like uh, the south of France or the south of Spain, um, this is a serious concern 
that uh, providing lots of upfront tax relief for people who are working and saving and then never getting any, uh, any tax payments because all the later expenditure takes place in another jurisdiction uh, doesn't look uh, terribly attractive. Okay, so we don't advocate applying this approach to all forms of uh, household saving, partly because we think it would be too complicated uh, to do so, and partly because we think it would be unnecessary. So what we set out in, in I think, chapter 14 or maybe 15 of, the, uh, of Tax by Design is uh, a somewhat pragmatic path towards a more neutral uh, tax treatment of savings, which combines different... Uh, approaches for different types of savings and, and different assets. So as I said earlier, for simple bank accounts, for standard interest-bearing accounts, which are particularly important for poorer households, we can simply exempt interest income completely from taxation, take them completely out of the tax net. Uh, we would get little or no revenue if we attempted to, uh, to tax rents on, uh, on simple bank accounts because banks uh, in general don't pay pay rents to the average uh, depositor. Um, for a variety of, of pragmatic reasons, we would, we would retain, uh, what it, re retain in the UK context the current approach, which is not to tax capital income, uh, in relation to owner-occupied housing and in relation to limited holdings of, of other risky assets. So in an ideal world, we would, we would apply a rate of return allowance approach to owner-occupied housing, but uh, that's just off the political map in the UK, and so that's not a battle we thought it was worth fighting uh, in, in, in this review. Uh, we already have uh, a tax-free treatment of, uh, of income and capital gains on, on limited holdings of, of risky assets in the UK. They're called Individual Savings Accounts, or ISAs, and we propose to, to keep those uh, for administrative simplicity. Uh, as I said earlier, for, for most forms of, of pension-related saving, we already have the expenditure tax treatment, and since we've already got it, it would be uh, infeasibly complicated to try and, and reform it in the RRA direction, even if we wanted to. So it seems, uh, for administrative reasons, a better idea to keep the expenditure tax treatment in relation to pension saving. And the, the, the novel proposal is that for substantial holdings... Of, uh, of risky assets, including uh, company shares, uh, company and government bonds, uh, mutual funds, investment property, second homes uh, and, and investment property, and uh, unincorporated business assets, uh, our proposal would be to tax them on this rate of return allowance basis. And if you think about the kinds of individuals who have substantial holdings of those assets, uh, we think they would be well capable of dealing with the administrative uh, issues uh, involved in, uh, in, administri in administering this. Um, we think for pension saving, though, there is a good argument for additional uh, fiscal incentives. So if we had a completely neutral system of all forms of saving, uh, why would anybody tie up their wealth for, for long periods uh, in illiquid forms like, like pension plans when they could simply keep, uh, keep, returns in, in, uh, keep their assets in much more, more liquid form? So uh, we think uh, in order to induce uh, uh, pension, pension savings, uh, there is a, a strong case for some additional fiscal incentive, probably not in the form we do it in the UK at present, which is a tax-free lump sum on retirement seems particularly badly designed if, if you want to encourage people to, uh, to, to, to provide annuity income for the rest of their life. Okay. Other than, than, than the pension case, we think there's a, there are uh, strong arguments for uh, capital income in excess of the normal rate of return uh, to be taxed at standard marginal rates, the same marginal rates as, as labour income. And, and we think that the, the key argument here is that where people have the opportunity to convert labour income into capital income, if you don't have the same marginal rates applying, uh, then you get all kinds of complexity uh, and distortions and indeed inequities. And we think that's particularly important in the setting of small businesses. So we, we discussed the Scandinavian style dual income tax approach, which explicitly has uh, lower tax rates on uh, capital income than labour income. And uh, 
we look at the we look at the problems that that's uh, introduced in uh, in taxing small businesses, which indeed has has recently led Sweden to uh, abandon that in favour of this uh, rate of return allowance approach in relation to uh, corporate source income. Okay, I'm probably running out of time, am I? Two minutes. Okay, well, I'm sure other people can talk in more detail about wealth transfers. I won't say anything about wealth transfers. On corporate taxation, let me just very briefly summarize. We would do the analog in the corporate income tax uh, uh, system as the rate of return allowance in the personal income tax system. In the corporate tax literature, that's known as the allowance for corporate equity. There are lots of problems with a standard corporate uh, income tax raising the cost of capital, raising the cost of capital more for investment financed by equity than investment financed by debt, generating a bias towards more use of debt and various other problems which I will skip over. So uh, our key, the, the, the key reason for, for all of these problems is attempting to tax the normal return uh, component of profits from equity financed corporate investment and, and they're solved in the same way by introducing uh, tax relief for the uh, normal rate of return or opportunity cost of using equity finance in the corporate uh, sector. And let me skip uh, right to the end. I've already talked about uh, small business taxation. Uh, small business taxation, I think, is, is the real testing ground for, for whether the, the, the tax system is coherent. This brings together the taxation of labour income and the taxation of capital income, brings together the personal tax system with the corporate tax system, and uh, certainly in the UK, and I conjecture in many other countries, this is where a lot of uh, problems with, uh, with the, the tax system as a whole are, are, uh, are revealed. And uh, one of the nice features about these, these approaches that I've uh, outlined is that they fit together completely naturally, and we think there will be substantial uh, scope for, for simplification and removing a lot of anti-avoidance legislation which is there now to prevent some tax-favoured form of income being used more than some tax-penalised form of income. So let me just finish with uh, some closing remarks. Uh, in recent years, it's often been suggested that uh, excessive consumption, that is too little saving and investment, and excessive borrowing have contributed to uh, the financial crisis and, and other recent economic problems. Uh, it's rather ironic in our view that the tax system in the UK and many other countries actively favours borrowing and actively discourages saving and investment. Uh, if we've got too much of these things, it seems rather perverse that we have a tax system which is positively favouring them. Uh, so we would suggest that reforming the tax treatment of capital income at both the corporate and the uh, personal level could potentially make uh, a useful contribution to promoting uh, growth and stability. And uh, in answer to the uh, usual criticism that this is all very well in theory but has no chance of being implemented in practice, we would, report, we would uh, draw your attention to pioneering tax reforms in Sweden where the rate of return allowance uh, approach is now used uh, in, their, in their personal tax, and uh, in Belgium, where the allowance for corporate equity is now used in their corporate tax. And uh, I was at a, at a conference about a month ago at the OECD in Paris, where I was somewhat relieved to learn, having, having had comments on, on these slides previously, uh, that uh, the delegates from Sweden and Belgium suggested that it wasn't a complete disaster and they were at least functioning. So uh, on that note of optimism, I will, uh, I will hand over. <laughs>